Hello. Yeah, uh, first of all, um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here today. It's an honor for me. Uh, my name is Luol Mayen, and um, I'm, I'm from South Sudan. That's like, uh, how many people know South Sudan here? Good. Uh, South Sudan is the youngest country in the whole world. We gained our independence in 2011. And today I'm going to talk about uh, educational uh, challenge. And, um, and actually the reason why I'm supposed to talk about it because we are here in this room today because we had the opportunity to be educated. We had an opportunity to be who we are today. But there's millions of people that have no access, that have no resources to actually be where we are today. And, and I'm going to talk about like, how can say kind of people be part of us as I am today part of you. So as you know, like, as I talk about South Sudan, like it's a country that has been raped by civil war, you know, since 1983. So my family had to flee the country and, um, and they had to find a place of refuge. So they had to go like, to a refugee camp where they can be able to find, you know, uh, you know, have peace of mind and be able to like have opportunities that, that they can be able to have like better resources for their future. So as they were going to, uh, to, to Northern Uganda, I was born on the way. So, and, and as I was born on the way, like, you know, first of all, like being in a refugee camp or being in a war-torn country it's not a, de a desire for somebody. You know, nobody deserves to live even in a refugee camp. And first of all, it's because when people think about refugees and education, you know, we feel like, you know, we, they, they don't deserve to be educated, but they do because they are part of us, they are human. And, uh, and, and thing that people think about is, we feel like being in a refugee camp is temporary. It's something like somebody's gonna be there for two, two years, one year, I've been there for 22 years. I'm 24 now. It's so the whole of my life, almost my family have been in a refugee camp for 25 years. So it wasn't easy for me even to learn. And uh, I had somebody to invest in me. We have 2.5 million refugees only from South Sudan. And all of us can be able to be part of that society, be part of change. And and from there, I remember like my mother had to believe in me. And you know, the problem we have as people, you know, maybe where we are today, we feel like the only solution the refugees need is to bring them to America or bring them, take them to wherever they are. No, we have to invest in them wherever they are. We have to give them resources because if that is their permanent house, they can be able to, to make it a better place for themselves. I remember like, the first time I saw a laptop was 2007. How many how, when was your first time you saw your, a laptop? I cannot guess, long time ago. So when I saw a laptop was during a refugee's registration. And when I saw a laptop, I was like, wow, I want to use that one day. And, and everyone was like, you're crazy. Like, what are you thinking about? And in 2013, like I came to my mother and I was like, I need to have a laptop. And she was like, what are you going to do with the laptop? There's no power. There's no money for us to buy for you, you know, the laptop. And there's nobody that's going to help you, train you to be, you know, to, to do software engineering or IT or how to use a computer. But because she was a mother to me, she had to use all the resources in the refugee camp. She worked for three years, looking for $300 to buy for me a laptop. All of us were there in the refugee camp. And when she got for me, the laptop, I was like, wow, so what is the next step? How will I get the education? Some of us feel like going to the best university is the best thing we can ever have. You know, being in the best city is the best thing that we can ever have. But like utilizing that small resources that you have to educate yourself is very important. And that's something that we have to address. In a refugee camp, there used to be an internet cafe, which is three hours far from where I used to live. And I would walk there every day, three hours, just to charge my laptop. And I remember one day when I came back home uh, to learn how to code, it was, so, it's, it was so hard. So I would use like offline tutorial, there was no internet. So I would just go 
download tutorial on how to program. Then I would come back home and then like learn C sharp, learn graphic design, trying by myself to be able to like learn something of what my mother's worked for. And I feel like for us today here, we can be able to be part of that change. So when I installed, when I went to Internet Cafe, my friend installed for me a video game called Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> yeah, it's like GTA Vice City. So I came back home and I opened my laptop and I found the, the video game. I never thought video game are created by people. I thought they fall from heaven because like, I don't know like how, how, how do I create even how like, like how can I create a video game? So when I start playing Grand Theft Auto, I realized that, you know, there's a power of game. And in a refugee camp or in a war affected areas, there's a lot of children and they love, they love to play. And you know, the good thing about game is you make decision. Everyone that play video game, they make decision. He, he was mentioning uh, Ninja before. And I'll talk about that later, but you know, there's, there's that power in game. So when I realized that, I realized that that was actually what is happening in the game is actually what is happening in my country. And if there's a lot of people playing the same game, how would they react to it? And how about using the same power of game because the medium is so powerful. The game industry is so powerful. Children are there, they want to play a video game. Our solution is not to tell them not to play a video game, but create a game that they can play with. And from there I thought in a refugee camp of like, how about creating a game for peace and conflict resolution? And the next step was like, how do I do this? The part of it, I got an investment from my mother. She bought for me a laptop and that was enough for me. There was a power where I can charge my laptop for three, uh, for like work three, three hours per day, then coming back. The worst thing is I would go there and find the generator is not working. And then I have to come back. Not even that, there was no food to eat. Like for you to sit on a computer and program, you need food to eat in a refugee camp. That was another thing. So there was a lot of things that are going on, you know, and today as a, you know, as I said before, it's an honor for me to be here. Like, I'm going to share with you one of the story, like my mother told me one day, and that's why I'm speaking here today. I don't, there was nothing really that I did so special in a refugee camp to become who I am today, or to become like maybe the first ever video game designer or like whatever it is. You know, when my mother, when they were living in a war country, uh, she told me that um, when three people go and because they, they used to be a lot of people that they love hunting. So they would go there and then hunt. And when they go there and if something affect, like something attack the three people and then what will happen is two people will, will be killed and one person uh, will survive. And I was like, what? I, I told my mother what happened. Like, you know, what is the power behind that there is only one person that, that survived? And she said, because that person was meant to come back and tell people what happened to the two people. And today, I feel like there's a lot of people in the world that are suffering. There's people that matter like you and like me, that we can be able to be part of. And I'm telling you today that we can be part of that and also like help them and become engineers and become like the, you know, the best people in the technology, in health and everything because they can even play basketball and everything. So I feel like we all matter and we can also be part of that change in the world. If you can go for the next, next slide. Uh, so as I was talking about, like, as, you, as, as my mother was saving money for three years, she would just like use broadery and, and that's how she, you know, she managed to get the money uh, to buy for me a laptop. For example, like the, the, the Mata Innovation Hub, it's, it's an amazing platform that brings people together and people like maybe in Africa and also in a refugee camp and they can be able to learn. You know, in a refugee camp, everyone wants to learn. Everyone wants to have second opportunity because the first opportunity is they have lost their home. They are not in their country. So, and they, they, they want to come out of that situation. So when we become part of that, it can help us and become like who I am today. And when I was in a refugee camp, when I made my first video game, I never thought like someone even in America would ever play my game. My main focus was to create a solution for the refugees. If you can see like that picture, that was like 2017 when I was in a big hut, like when I was playing with the refugee uh, in a refugee camp, 
and we look, when you look at that tweet, was one month ago when, uh, when, when there was a talk about if the video game caused violence. And the whole game industry, even the president of Nintendo, was tweeting about it and saying, what Wall is doing is a powerful story in the video game industry. And, and that was the whole thing that the industry is talking about. So when you invest in people, you see what happened. We cause change. And right now, I'm working on the first ever video game. It's called Salam. Salam, it's a video game that put a player in the shoes of a refugee. So what happened in the game, as you play the game, you take a refugee from a war country to a peaceful environment. And uh, as you play, like the problem that we're having today, we feel like when someone becomes a refugee, that's what we care about. But in the game, what we care about is the journey. What it has taken someone to become a refugee on their way. So in the game, you have to feed a refugee, you have to give them food, you have to give them water. And this is the first ever video game to be able to bridge the virtual world and the reality on the ground. What I'm trying to say is when someone buy food in the game, you're actually buying someone in a refugee camp food. When you buy water in the game, because you need food so that your character have the energy to run, you're buying someone in a refugee camp water. The same thing with medicine in the game. And imagine we are publishing it on instant game that have over 700 million players. So this is, you and me can be part of this change. And, uh, and when you invest in people, you have to ask yourself, how can I be part of this? How can I be part of the world changes? And you are, you are here today. And that's the gameplay. And in 2018, I won the Global Gaming Citizen. Uh, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. So the most, what, what I love about this award is because it is the first of its kind in the video game industry. There was nothing like this before, so they had to create a new category that recognized people that are using the power of game to bridge global communities. And, and, and we have to create this in the industry and be part of the chain. And um, yeah, like uh, this year, I was recognized at South Sudan United for, uh, for Achievement Award. Someone who has been in a refugee camp for 22 years. And I'm so excited that someone who was living with me in a refugee camp invested in me. And, and that's why I'm talking to you today. I feel like you can be part of this and join Mata and join like, there's, there's, there's a lot of way you can be able to like be part of the change. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.